Hello and welcome to another episode of the Animals at Home podcast. I hope your day is going well so far and hope you've had a good last few weeks since the last time we've chatted. Yesterday I was really excited. Uh, my friend Jana over at ARC, which is the Amazon Rainforest Conservancy, sent me a message on Facebook and she had uh, she just shared a post with me from a, another Facebook group, a photography company named Untamed Photography. And these, uh, I guess these gentlemen were, were walking through the Amazon to take pictures and they stumbled across one of the rarest reptiles in the Amazon known as the banded golly wasp. This is an animal that I have never heard of before and I've never even seen before. Uh, I shared the post on my Facebook group. So you find that at Animals at Home CA on Facebook. Really, really cool. Definitely go check it out. It's sort of this skink looking type character with very thick black and white bands. Um, you know, another great example and another great reason for why we we need to do our best to make sure we're protecting the the forest because there's unbelievable species like that that I've never even seen before. So so that was really cool. So thank you to uh, Jana for sending me that. I really do hope you have been enjoying the podcast so far. And if you are enjoying it, definitely consider going to your Apple podcasting app and rating the show. I would absolutely love a five star rating and uh, to leave a comment. That would be absolutely fantastic. Of, of course, the more comments and the more ratings we get, the bigger the show is going to get. And I, I have seen the numbers actually increase over the last three or four weeks of downloads of the of the podcast. So I can only assume that's from you guys sharing the content and, and letting your friends know or sharing it on Instagram or whatever it is. So I really appreciate that. Definitely keep listening if you're enjoying it and definitely feel free to send me an email. I've had a few emails of people just thanking me for producing the show. I really appreciate those types of emails because it just helps me understand you know, that I am producing the content that people want to hear. On today's show, I am joined by Colin Langendifer. Colin is the owner of Crosstown Exotics, which is a traveling bug and reptile show in the Chicagoland area. Colin is a classic reptile hobbyist. You can tell from the passion in his voice, he, he really does love the animals that he's working with. And, and even more so, I think he, he seems to love the presentations and the educational side to the business that he started. And for one, the collection that he has is incredible. We, we talk about his anaconda and alligator and caiman lizard. And you know, there's a, there's a whole other slew of animals that, that we chat about during this episode. But he also reveals this sort of concept that they have in their business called critter classes. And it, it was definitely one of the, my favorite things that I pulled from from this conversation. We had a fantastic conversation, but this one piece about this critter class, I think is a really, really unique idea. And I hope it takes off in other areas as well, because I think it's what we need to just keep perpetuating the right things in the hobby. So at, at some point in sort of the midpoint of this interview, you'll hear him chat about that. And I think like me, you'll actually really enjoy the concept. So without anything further, here's my conversation with Colin. Hi, I'm Dylan, and you're listening to the Animals at Home podcast. All right, Colin, well, thank you for joining me this evening. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me. I don't think there's uh, a better way to spend a Wednesday evening than chatting reptiles, so I really appreciate you coming on. And uh, obviously, I think you have a really important role in, in the hobby, and I want to chat about that, of course, and, and you also have a really unique collection of animals that, that we're definitely going to jump into. Um, was there a moment in your childhood that stands out as a moment that made you realize you had a passion for animals? Uh, I would say back when I was younger, my dad owned the landscaping business and uh, he'd take me out and um, I don't know if you know what aeration is, but it's those big machines that core up the earth and helps, you know, helps, uh, helps the soil, um, you know, get some oxygen in there. And uh, that was, I guess, in the beginning of the aeration days, but he'd take me out and I would shuck cores and stuff like that. And we would always find random snakes and whatnot, um, just crawling through the yards or the fields. And so I would always pick those up and try and get them out of the way of, you know, wherever we were working for that day. So I think just from a younger age, it was finding those snakes, you know, the garters, the decay snakes and stuff. Um, and just, you know, finding the passion through there. Yeah, those things definitely stick out in your in your mind for sure. And then uh, did you, at some point you got into the hobby, I'm guessing, you what was your first kind of introduction to yeah. owning reptiles? Yeah. So initially, um, I was kind of more drawn to the furrier things, um, and quickly realized that I was allergic to most everything with fur. So, um, my parents were like, well, since he can't have snowball or rabbit anymore, um, you know, he should probably get something that's hypoallergenic. So we started off with a snake named Buddy. It was an albino corn snake. Uh, we got from Josh, uh, or Josh, we got from, um, Brian Potter over at Chicago Reptile House. And, uh, yeah, that was uh, that was kind of the beginning there. And even then, I wasn't all that sold on the snakes. I mean, the ones that I caught outside were fine. But when it came to this thing living in my room, I was a bit intimidated. I uh, One of my favorite films growing up was Jungle Book. And 
everyone knows that the snake in jungle book hypnotizes you and tries to eat you. So I was under the impression at, you know, seven years old that this animal was going to try and hypnotize me eventually and eat me. So, um, but I got over that, got over the feeding the live mice and everything, because again, you know, when you're that young, you don't really understand the concept. So, um, you know, I thought that was a really good learning curve there of you know, the circle of life. And, um, you know, and that animal was obviously never going to waste because it was fueling another animal. So, but yeah, no, it started with the corn snake. Yeah, that's, that's very interesting. I think a lot of people that are in the reptile hobby definitely have that uh, furry allergy. I have the same right, thing. Right allergic to cats. I, we had dogs, but a lot of short haired dogs that I was kind of okay with, but a lot of things just make me stuffed up. Like basically like I have a cold hundred percent of the time. Right. Yeah. We have poodles. So yeah. So poodles are like the only dogs that we can keep dogs with actual hair. not for. Yeah, exactly. Those hyperallergenic. And then, right. so you had, so tell me about how, how it evolved from obviously as a seven year old with uh, the corn snake to what you're doing now so that you don't just jump from that uh, in a year. I'm sure, I'm sure that was a lot of growth. In right. There. Yeah. Definitely. Um, so yeah, I mean, from there, I mean, like every hobbyist, I mean, I guess not like every hobbyist, but some are content with one animal, but, um, you know, being that young, you're reading all these books and I'm seeing, you know, different creatures. So again, it started with the corn snake, then eventually led to a leopard gecko, then a ball python and a bearded dragon. So, um, I, you know, as I progressed in my husbandry and with keeping these animals and whatnot, I, you know, just start, started to get some animals that became a little bit more, um, novice and, and, um, into like a, an expert level, you know, uh, keeping. So, um, did you, when you were growing up, did you want to pursue, a, a, a job that had working with animals or was sort of the pets just a, a hobby? Yeah. Um, I always thought it'd be cool to work at a zoo and, uh, you know, as I got into high school and stuff and started researching there, the, the actual salaries for those positions didn't look as, as, as appetizing as, as, you know, other, uh, other, uh, fields, but yeah, it's a lot um, of Mr. Noodles. So I always knew that I wanted to do right. It is. Yeah. Um, and so again, some people that do make great money doing it, but at the same time, you know, the majority of them don't really make a livable salary nowadays. So, um, but yeah, uh, I guess going into more of the educational field, um, at the age of like 10, um, I had gotten into contact with a, a local guy who was teaching uh, wildlife education programs. And from there, by the age of like 12, um, I was helping him um, clean his animals, helping him do shows. And by 13 and 14, my parents were literally dropping me off with a set of animals to a party or an event. And I was doing shows on my own. Wow. Um, so that was kind of like the slow evolution of it. But even before then, um, my mom was a preschool teacher. And so I would take literally every animal in my collection when I was like eight, nine, 10, um, and go to a preschool and just show off every animal that I had. It was a ridiculous, like, um, you know, menagerie of tanks and things like that. It wasn't as, as professional and as, and as efficient as I am now with all this stuff. But, um, looking back at some of those old photos, I, I can't help but laugh. That's awesome. So you've really been doing this almost your whole life. Yeah. It's, I, when I, I actually really had to think about it the other day, but, um, yeah, I mean, it's been, it's literally been my whole life. That's really interesting. And then at, at what point did Crosstown Exotics come into existence? Uh, that happened in 2012. And uh, that was actually after uh, we had started working with a production company, um, just a local production company, but they're, uh, they're known, I mean, worldwide um, in the haunt industry. Um, and I don't know what the, like, there's any haunted houses that are in Canada, or if you guys have like a big industry for that up there. But um, down here in Chicago, it's, it's a, it's a booming industry. And, um, the, the head of this production company wanted us to do a promotion. Um, and it was like this little promotion on like a science lab and they had a couple snakes and everything in this video. And he goes, you know, you could do this full time. And I was kind of scratching my head like, oh, I actually didn't know that I could do something like that. Um, and so that kind of got my wheels turning. Um, and I sent out some emails and things and, um, to a couple big production companies around here. Um, and eventually back in, I guess in 2015 is when I actually, uh, got followed up with, but, um, in 2012, that same year, um, I had kind of gotten out of things. I was just focusing on school and my best friend who did that stuff with me, um, him and I just decided to team up and get back into it since we missed it so much. Oh, that's very cool. And so that production stuff, that's, you know, bringing animals to uh, a set or, or I guess are those haunted house more like live settings where people are walking through type thing? 
Yeah. So um, the the production, yeah, the production company I work with puts on uh, Statesville Haunted Prison and Hell's Gate Haunted House, and these are um, these are like the top tier, like almost Disney attract, like the closest you can get to a Disney attraction as possible. And they build these gorgeous sets um, that look like you know real caverns and caves and whatnot. And they've built these beautiful enclosures for them to be on uh, on set. Um, and so people can get a natural feel of like they're actually walking inside of a cave or they're walking into whatever. And so they're just a nice accent to, um, you know, the actual attraction itself. Oh, that's very cool. And then obviously yeah. sort of linked with that is you, you start doing the presenting and bring and educational shows, obviously what you're already doing, correct. but now you've linked it to the, the Crosstown Exotics brand. Yeah, correct. Yeah. So the the presenter model is really interesting because I think I'm sure you experience this as well. There's people like yourself who do a great job and I think are super beneficial to the hobby. And then there's always like the sketchy guy with like snakes in a suitcase. Right. <laughs> there's, there's very much Please two. Tell me you saw that video. Did you see that video? No. What was, what was that? Oh no. We'll have to talk about it later, but there's, there's a guy out there that, uh, there, I'll, I'll see if I can find the video, but, um, I know urban jungles had posted it. Um, uh, it was a couple, couple years ago, maybe even a year ago, but there's a guy that put a like a full grown retic in a suitcase. Oh my god! Um, and that it just didn't end well. So yeah, yeah. Look up that video. Yeah, it's I'll find there. it. I'll look on urban uh, urban jungles. Um, yeah, cause, and there's definitely people out there like that. And you know, so you have this like two sort of paradigm. What, what do you think? Like, what are the characteristics about yourself that make this more of a successful and beneficial model? Like, do do you, do you know what, where your success comes from, and and where maybe those uh, sketchy people are going wrong? Yeah, um, I guess it's. I guess to put it simply, I think it's your standard of, um, standard of self. I mean a lot of people are settling for mediocre. Um, and when, you know, you've grown up in the industry, we've had a lot of different you know, reptile swaps come through and whatnot. And you see how people are kind of doing it by the seat of their pants instead of waiting for the proper time to, um, to execute them. So, um, I've always thought that if we're going to do something, we want to look professional, um, we need to act respectable and we need to bring the best um, representations of, you know, these animals that we can. Um, and I, I think that's led us in, in, you know, in a great direction. But um, yeah, honestly, I think it's just settling. It's not settling for, for anything less than excellent. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And I think you're totally right. It's, and, and that's kind of why I asked that question, because I think there's a lot of people that may, might have a larger collection and think, oh, I'm just going to start presenting. And then they end up as the guy in the with a reticulated python in a suitcase. And they haven't right. you know, done the thought process and, and realize how much work a business like this actually is. Right. And I'll even say too, I mean, over the years, I've had to um, refine the animals that I've been keeping and really, you know, take time to with my purchases in the sense where if something, um, cause I do breed animals on the side. I have my, uh, a few breeding projects that I, I really you know, enjoy, um, you know, just for the hobby of it. But, um, the animals that I do keep, they, they can't be animals that need, um, you know, more, more work than they're worth, if that makes any sense. Um, but a lot of the animals need to have a great disposition from the get go. Um, a lot of the animals we try and get as babies. And so, um, like you were saying, most people, you know, they have a big group of animals. They think they can start doing shows. Well, a lot of time you do need to spend uh, a decent, a decent uh, portion of your time just getting those animals tolerant of interaction. You need to get them used to traveling. Some, I, I mean, we've had animals that, um, you know, did great with just interaction. But when it came to traveling, they that was something new to them. They're putting they're put in a, in a, uh, in a tote and they're, you know, driven, you know, 30 minutes across town and then pop there, you know, it's kind of like a, a time travel to that, like where they're like, oh no, I'm in a different spot now. So just getting them used to those things. And we, we call those ambassadors in training. Um, and so we always preference, uh, we'll normally bring one to each show if we are, if we do have one in training and we will preference, it'll be something, you know, midway through the show and we'll say, Hey, you know, this is an animal that is an ambassador in training. Um, you know, so again, he's not perfect like the rest of them that, um, you know, I have great dispositions that are just sitting right there ready for you to, to love on them and, and, and handle them. Um, so, you know, you know, please, you know, uh, keep in mind that this animal is getting used to this. And so when we preference that, that's normally the best way to go about it instead of just taking it out and seeing how it goes. 
because I've had times where we have this uh, a rhino iguana, Kumba, and uh, if you know, I've seen any of my latest posts, he's beautiful. He's, he sits perfectly on the table, but six months prior to that, I mean, he was doing some of his first shows and, um, you know, he was great inside our house and in the room and stuff, but he would kind of freak out a little bit when he saw the big crowd. So it does take, it does take a lot of time and work to get these animals, um, you know, tolerant of, of being interactive with the public. Yeah. And it's, I mean, obviously it's a very foreign environment for a reptile to be in, but it does really speak to the level of intelligence of these animals. A lot of people think that there's not much there. They're just kind of bopping around and, and not really thinking, but or I don't know if I shouldn't say the word thinking, but clearly there's some learning that takes place because you have an animal right. that six months ago couldn't handle it. And now it's habituated to, uh, to that experience. Correct. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about what uh, like a typical show would look like if like you're doing an educational show, what, what, what does the kind of layout look like? Yeah. Um, so, you know, first and foremost, um, we introduce the, the ground rules for, for every uh, show that we do. So number one, we always say we want to keep our voices down. Um, you know, we always say that, you know, we understand that people don't get to see animals like this on a daily basis. So, um, you know, we respect that, but also respect that, um, you know, we do need to keep it quiet for the animals. And we also want to hear any questions that you may have um, throughout the show. Um, so we'd like to be able to get, uh, you know, address as many as possible. Um, number two, we always like to preference that it's not fear factor. So we're not eating cockroaches or kissing alligators. Um, we're always, um, you know, uh, we're always asking for people or for volunteers to, to handle the animals. But if you are scared of stuff, you know, we always preference that, again, people next to you might want to touch these animals. So just just know that we will respect your wishes on not wanting to touch the animal, but just know that someone close to you may want to. So, um, and then, you know, uh, most importantly is washing your hands uh, at the end of every show. Um, not because these animals carry salmonella, but all animals in general, you just want to wash your hands after each show. Um, and we like to start um, our ambassadors from the smallest to the largest, because I feel like every good show, whether it's fireworks or, you know, a movie or whatever you want to, you want to end with the, the big finale. Um, so we end with our biggest ambassador, Missy. Um, but we, we go through with, you know, invertebrates. So we'll bring some basic cockroaches or like a vinegaroon or a scorpion. Um, then we do some amphibians. We've got some beautiful, um, you know, we've got some beautiful African giant bullfrogs, um, smooth sided toads, which are great, um, you know, beautiful ambassadors for amphibians. Um, not to say that the smaller ones aren't, aren't, um, aren't just, aren't as good, but, um, I feel like the bigger ones kind of make, get the point across and we keep our smaller ones for some of our setup and displays where they're less likely to, to be interacted with and, you know, hop off or something. But, um, then we do a turtle and a tortoise. So that's typically our, our alligator snapping turtle, uh, Rocco and our, uh, 80 pound tortoise, uh, Mortis, who's a African spurred thigh tortoise. And then we'll do three lizards. So we'll break it up into a herbivore, a carnivore and an omnivore, and then, uh, two snakes. So we'll typically bring Missy, our big, 14, 15 foot Burmese python, and then uh, like a smaller subspecies of, uh, of snake. But we've typically been using one of our green anacondas for our, for our second biggest. Yeah, that's awesome. I, as a kid, I bet they have an unbelievable time. Even the ones that are scared, I bet just love it. Right. Um, and, you know, a lot of times uh, people go into uh, shows um, trying to, I guess, uh, get people to overcome their fears and um, and, and, you know, they'll say that, you know, going into the show, but for us, um, it's been a huge compliment that that's almost a byproduct of our presentation where, um, you know, you'll hear people say, you know, in the back, oh, you know, I'm not going to touch that or whatever, but by the end of it, they're the ones that are coming up and petting the animal and saying, this is the first time I've ever touched this or touched that. Um, you know, we never go into it trying to get anyone to, trying to get anyone to overcome their fear, but, you know, keep it casual enough and um laid back enough to for them to uh you know to feel comfortable enough to to come up and touch an animal yeah you definitely want them to come to you and i mean everybody like when you're trying to get someone to overcome a fear you can't force them to overcome it it, it, right. it really needs to come from their decision where they watch the animals interact with other people and they hey maybe i can like pet pet the snake's tail and then at the end of the night i'm sort of holding the animal yeah for sure so I really love your mission statement on the website uh, on, that you have on the website. Can you talk a little bit about the sort of the mission surrounding uh, the program? Yeah. So um, just, I mean, all in all, I feel like there's, you know, quite a few people that have, you know, that same twist as a, as a mission statement. But, um, 
a lot of the animals that we work with, um, you know, specifically the, the alligator snapping turtle, Rocco, green anacondas, um, all the cyclura that we use, um, monkey tail skinks, um, those animals are, you know, are, are threatened, endangered species, um, you know, where they're from. And uh, if they're not at the forefront of, I don't want to say, if they're not in the forefront of this industry where people are getting the exposure with them, um, I, I don't see why people would even bother wanting to save them. Um, and so when we have these, you know, these you know, amazingly tolerant and loving uh, ambassadors like Marty, our monkey tailed skank or Kumba, the, the rhino iguana, um, people aren't going to make connections, uh, you know, without them. Uh, when you go to the zoo, uh, there's a famous line from a, a, a famous, uh, a famous uh, educator, Jim Nessie, who says, when you go to the reptile house, what's normally going on? Nothing. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing at all. Um, you don't see those animals a lot. They make those cages so well that those animals are normally doing what they do in the wild, which is hide. Mm -hmm. um, and so I love that we get to bring these animals to the public and display them um, like they should be. And not, you know, not bashing on zoos at all, because again, zoos serve their purpose, but we get to take it that step further and allow hands on interaction with these animals. Yeah, no, I think that makes total sense to me. And I, it's something I've talked about before. And, you know, when you w talk to the academic community, sometimes they sort of frown on the hobbyist community. But I do think that right. people like yourself are really at the forefront of introducing new people to the hobby in a, in a way that science never will be able to because the scientists are, you know, years ahead of these, these people. And you're not presenting academic papers to kids. Kids right. want to see and feel, and those are the impressions that will, you know, that could change the trajectory of a kid's life. He might want to go into studying or conservation or, or herpetology or something along those lines. Right, and I'm, a, and honestly, I'm a byproduct of my industry. Um, the first person to do my my birthday party was a gentleman by the name of Dave Vanasso, and he is still doing shows to this day. Um, and it's great when I can call up Dave and say, "Hey, Dave, you know, I got a question on on this or that." Um, and so the fact that he's been so open with, um, you know, helping me and, and my, and my growth as a, as a company, um, has, has been amazing. So again, it, it is a true testament to, um, you know, the impact that these shows have, because obviously I'm doing what I'm doing today because of, you know, the, the people that have done this before me. And I can obviously, um, continue the message that they did prior. Is it? Your, would you consider this to be your dream job? I know it's not your full-time job, but maybe one day eventually it would be. Is this something that you can see yourself doing for a long time? Um, yeah, I definitely think so. Um, and I'd say that because, you know, as of now, again, I, I've got one foot in, one foot out, like all but most of us do in the hobby where, you know, we can't, you know, have a, a dream job of doing this full-time. But um, no, I think this is, this would be an amazing job to have full-time. Again, being self-employed obviously there's the stressors there but when it comes down to the work it's i mean you can't you can't beat it what are some of the most stressful parts of, of the job obviously we've talked about some of the rewarding parts yeah um i would say some of the venues um you know being at a birthday party um it, it, i guess it also depends on the parents too um but being at a birthday party it's just the you know time of day like if it's earlier in the day or earlier in the afternoon you're good but if you've got you know, if you're at like a four or five o'clock party, you're worried about, you know, adults that have been drinking and they become a little bit more, you know, liberal with what they're, they would normally do. And, you know, it's, that can get kind of uh, nerve wracking where you're like, man, I don't think I should be telling a, an adult how to conduct themselves at a party. But, um, you know, you will get that from time to time. It's not as often, um, it's not as often as you think, which is great. I mean, most of the time people are very respectful, but, um, you know, you will get those random people, um, that will come up and, you know, they'll start handling your animal the way that they think they should. And you definitely have to correct them. Um, the other nerve wracking thing is that when introducing an animal to someone for the first time and they want to hold it, it's getting them to that point where you feel comfortable with them handling that creature. Um, and that can definitely take a long time to build up an intuition on who is ready to and who is not. Um, and most of the time when you feel someone is a little hesitant or may even back away when you go to put that animal in their hands, um, you know, I generally start off with saying, Hey, would you like to pet this animal first before you hold it? And then after that, you can weed out the people who are normally after they pet it, they're like, you know what? That's it. I, that's all I want to do. You're like, all right, cool. Awesome. I'm glad I didn't 
you know, push it to that, you know, the next level or, um, you know, uh, give into what you wanted initially, um, you know, because again, that animal could have been on the floor or, or, or whatever, but, um, you know, it definitely does take a little bit of time to build up that intuition and reading people's, you know, uh, language and, and body, uh, you know, body signals. Yeah, definitely. Cause it's, you're so right. It's their reaction to getting freaked out by something that's going to injure the animal. Most likely like typically the, right. the, the animal might move in a funny way, not being defensive or aggressive at all, but the kid might really twitch or, or you know, pull back too aggressively. Yeah, Yes, you definitely got to watch for that. And I know you guys do actually some like themed uh, parties as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, it's not anything that we advertise, but people will call us up like, um, I think it was two weekends ago, we got to do um, a Harry Potter event, which was absolutely amazing. Um, I'm a big fan of just cinema in general, but um, going to this Harry Potter event, we it just adding that, that you know, extra element to this this uh, Harry Potter day held at this library was honestly, I think I enjoyed it more than the kids did. Um, but because and I guess this kind of leads into, you know, uh, why I wanted to do, you know, cinema so much is that when you grow up, I mean, I don't know how old, how old are you doing? I'm 27. Okay. So I'm, I'm 28. So we grew up in the same time Yeah. and growing up, we didn't have YouTube when we were you know super young. So, you know, most of these kids have the world at their fingertips. All we had was, books, magazines, you know, television shows and movies. And a lot of the times my first impression of an animal was through a movie or through a television show. And so um, these kids get to, you know, see those films and see the animals within the films. And so bringing that element right in front of them so they could physically interact with it was, I think, you know, one of the best things you could possibly do. Yeah, that is so cool. I, I can just imagine how amazing that would be. I mean, I'm sure, I guess kids now are still into Harry Potter, right? They still love Harry Potter. Yeah, honestly, it was more of the parents. <laughs> it was more of the parents that were like, oh, hey, you know, Johnny, hey, Susie, you know, like, go check this out. And they're like, mom, I don't know what you're talking about. But Come on, um, it's they Harry certainly Potter. like to dress up and they liked it. Exactly. So, you know, I would have, you know, I would have thought that the kids would have seen it. But again, you got to think that when the first Harry Potter came out, some of them weren't even born. Oh, so yeah. I don't know why they'd be getting into it now. So. Yeah, that's true. It's kind of getting dated at this point. And then the, right. the other thing I wanted to ask is uh, as something that you have on your website, of what you've labeled as sort of critter classes. Yeah. So what's the difference between that and, and a presentation? Yeah. So a presentation um, is more for like a private event. And the critter classes we are now offering through park districts. And this is something that, um, you know, we, we develop because we're seeing a lot of times, uh, you know, parents don't want to spend money on, you know, birthday parties or things like that. And the kids are want to see something on more of a regular basis. Um, and they offer stuff like that through our zoos, but the zoo can be, you know, about an hour away. And sometimes they're a little bit more expensive than, um, than what these kids, you know, and their families can afford, um, just for a short period of time. Uh, critter classes are four week. Uh, courses. They're every, you know, Tuesday or Thursday, depending on what, you know, what uh, uh, park district that we're at. But it gives kids more of a one-on-one -on -one, um, interaction for an hour with, with some of the creatures that we work with. So, um, you know, it, it used to go um, by topic. So we'd have a month where we did snakes, turtles, tortoises, you know, all that stuff. But we decided to just call them critter classes with no topics. They're just Critter classes, whatever we bring, we bring because parents were not signing the kids up for like the snake class because they were intimidated, but the kids really wanted to see the stuff. So um, once we stopped that, we saw that enrollment went up way more than we expected it to. Um, and the kids were getting to see what they wanted. And so normally the first class will ask like, hey, like, what are your favorite animals? What do you guys want to see? And we will cater, you know, the classes to the students that are there and we'll normally have a day where we bring um, the kids favorite animals. Um, it's like one of the, the, you know, the last classes. It's like a, it's like a farewell type of thing. That is really cool. So it's almost like just an after school extracurricular type. Uh, Pretty thing much. Yeah. Um, and in the warmer months too, um, the first half an hour of the classes, we will go outside. Um, and some of them like, the one park district is right next to a forest reserve. So we'll go and we'll look like next month, we'll go look for salamanders. We'll go look for different things and we'll learn about things that we see outside. Um, and two that, you know, that doesn't, 
um, meaning that we stop at animals. We'll talk about plants. We'll talk about nature in general. Um, just because the kids are just so interested in what's outside that, you know, you kind of have to, um, you know, feed the, you know, feed their, their brains with all that stuff. Yeah. They'll sort of um, direct and the other you. One is, right. Exactly. They'll ask, you know, what is this leaf or what is this? And, um, I was really into botany and, and uh, horticulture in college and I still am. Um, so I do know, you know, a general amount of stuff. So, you know, I can at least help them, um, you know, in, in some way with that kind of stuff. That's really cool. So the kids that don't want to play soccer can go learn about snakes. Right. And a lot of times too, that's why we try to offer at different times of year because there'll be times where it's you know, soccer season or it's basketball season. And so some kids can't make certain uh, sessions. Um, and so we're trying to offer it, you know, more times uh, a year so that kids can, you know, that are in sports can come back and do that. So. That's awesome. That's a really, really cool program. So let's chat about some, I know you've kind of mentioned some of the animals that you have, but um, let's chat yeah. about that collection. You have, yeah. how, how big is your collection right now? Uh, my house, it's, uh, and I say my house because my, my best friend, my business partner, Mike, um, he has his own collection, but he brings a lot of stuff, um, you know, from his collection to cross town exotics as well. So, you know, basically both of our collections, um, combined are cross town exotics, but, um, my personal collection is around like a hundred or so animals. And they're all at your, in your home. Yeah. They're all in the house. Yeah. That's a full-time job right there. It, it definitely can be. I mean, my, my weekends, if I'm not doing shows, I'm, I'm, I'm on the, or, uh, you know, I'm on the, uh, or I'm in the garage, you know, cleaning cages, feeding animals, watering animals. So it's, it, it's become part of life is just taking care of animals and trying to take care of myself. So. Yeah, I hear you. So, so tell me about some of those animals. I know people want to hear what, what you have. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, we've got, um, you know, we've got a retic, a tiger retic who's still growing up. Um, we've got a few Burmese pythons. It's like, we call it the Cuddles lineage because, uh, it started off with Mr. Cuddles, the, the Burmese python, and we got him a couple of girls and we've actually have a few offspring from Mr. Cuddles. So, um, the, I guess our collection is, is a direct reflection on how we like to run our programs where we don't like to use just one animal for our shows. You know, now that we're, um, you know, double booking and triple booking shows. If we can give an animal a break day by day, we definitely will. Um, and so we do definitely do like to have a, it's weird to say this, but like a roster where we have, you know, uh, an A team, a B team that we can rotate through so that these animals aren't getting overworked again, because they are first and foremost, they're pets. Um, and whenever it's becoming too stressful for these animals to do so, they're retired, they're not you know, but we actually, we've never even had to do that yet because I think we've, we've done this from the beginning and my knowledge prior to starting Crosstown, I think has definitely helped us with the longevity of these animals and, and having them, you know, happy and healthy. But, um, yeah, so we've, we've got a few berms, albinos and, and wild types or normals, whatever you want to call them, uh, more people, but, um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, we've got some corn snakes and we normally keep a lot of the corn snakes for, um, you know, the production aspect of things. I, I love corn snakes. I don't think I'll ever um, get tired of corn snakes. I think they're absolutely beautiful. Um, but you know, when we have a production asking for, um, you know, like a group of snakes, you can't really hold a, a bundle of uh, king snakes or something like that, because obviously they don't want to try and eat each other. Um, so, you know, corn snakes are always good for that type of thing. And with critter classes, um, it's, it's amazing because some kids, you know, believe it or not, don't, you know, have never even seen a corn snake. So it's great that we get to provide stuff like that. Um, even during our presentations, I try not to bring any animals that are, that you can find at Petco uh, or at your local pet store because, um, or uh, how should I say this? Not an expert shop or a specialty shop. Right. Um, you know, if I'm bringing a, a Russian tortoise or a bearded dragon, I, to me, um, for our show, I, I don't think that's acceptable. Now, again, I'm not bashing people that do, but I would like to bring animals that you wouldn't normally get to see at your local pet shop. Um, and I think that's what kind of separates us in the midst of, you know, of, of the many educators here in the Chicago area. Um, but we do like to bring those animals to critter classes because again, it's an introductory level. It's to get these kids, um, you know, used to handling and, 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 in the, uh, and introduced to like basic hydrogen and hydrogen care. So, um, but, um, yeah, we keep milk snakes. I really like the Honduran milk snakes a lot. Um, I've got some high white cow kings that I'm 
uh, that I'll be breeding again this year, uh, Mexican black king snakes. Um, I've been keeping for, oh my gosh, almost eight years now. Um, and it was a huge surprise finding out that, what was it like two years ago, they started, you know, bumping up in price. And, you know, now I think you could sell a baby for 250 bucks. Like it's, it's ridiculous when I couldn't get rid of them for 40 bucks a piece, you know, three years ago. Yeah. It's weird so, how the market um, works like you know, that. It's kind of nice. Yeah. So it's kind of nice to see a little bit of a, you know, appreciation for the animals that you've been just breeding since day one. Um, so that was nice. Um, the, what else? So the Mexican black king snakes, I've got a pair of gray bands that I'm raising up a female now. Um, and I, those are absolutely gorgeous as well. Um, uh, what else do I got there? Um, we got some carpet pythons, um, a, a short tail python, um, some blue tongue skinks. I really love blue tongue skinks. Uh, it was like one of my favorite lizards growing up and I've had some success uh, breeding those animals and hopefully we'll have a couple layers this year. Um, the monkey tails are amazing. I can't get enough of those things. Uh, they're like reptilian sloths. Um, they look so cool do, too. Yeah. Um, and uh, in, in feeding those animals too, I mean, feeding them a pothos, uh, which is just a regular house plant, but it's something that is grown where they live and they absolutely love it. Like they really? will demolish a pothos plant um, in minutes. Um, I remember the first time I gave my guy a pothos plant or one of one of the two, Marty and Cucumbers, the it's the female's name, but uh, Marty didn't leave the pothos plant for like a day. And I was like, but he didn't eat anything. He just laid inside of there. And I was like, oh, this makes me feel so good. Like, you know, again, like when you set up a cage real nice and the animals are really digging it, like I would have never expected him. Or I, I guess I just wasn't expecting that reaction of him just like hugging this plant like it was a piece of home um, because Marty was a direct import. Um, there was a, a confiscation of animals. Um, uh, I guess it was a year, two years ago now, maybe three years, uh, two and a half years. But um, it's confi uh, confiscation of, of monkey-tailed skinks um, that was brought over to uh, an individual here in Illinois. And those animals were, were treated, you know, dewormed, um, given a medical evaluation, and then distributed to educators, um, you know, throughout you know, the United States. Um, and I was lucky enough to get one. I think uh, Brandon Fowler, another educator out of California, was able to get the other one, George. Um, and so, um, yeah, it's it's nice to to give that animal a piece of home when he was taken away from his home so um you know and i know a lot of those animals start off as imports and and obviously are become established here in captive breeding but um you know it was it was kind of nice just to see his reaction and how much he loved that plant yeah that's awesome home. and pothos are literally like the easiest plant to care for if anyone right like, I, that's what i always have in my in my geckos terrariums because i'm not the best at caring for plants those things right. like i can't kill them Right, right. It, they're amazing. I mean, even if you don't have the proper light, like it doesn't matter. No, um, those crazy. plants just keep on growing and growing and growing. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. So, um, yeah, um, but yeah, we've just got several iguana species. Uh, we've got um, you know a red, uh, an exanthic, or a blue. Um, a green iguana named Zoe, who's potty trained and is like is like a dog. It's it's amazing how um, how domesticated and um, you know, and just co how comfortable he is, you know, just being out in the open and just interacting with people. Um, he sleeps at the foot of my bed every single night. Uh, it is, I, I, you couldn't make this stuff up. It's, it's absolutely amazing how this animal um, has adapted to captivity and just enjoys human interaction. So he does that on his own. He just crawls into the room and. Yeah. Wow. Like, so I have him um, before I, before I, uh, I was given Zoe, this is the, the green iguana's name. Um, they thought he was a girl, and uh, I quickly said, "Hey, you know, his dewlap is, you know, is quite big, and his jowls are very big, so that you know kind of indicates that he's a boy." And so they were kind of bummed, but Zoe responds to his name, so he didn't want to change it. Um, but um, he was a free roaming animal. They, the kid that had given him to me, um, the room was like decked out for an iguana, like it was basically a bed, and then everything else was for the iguana. Um, and so I don't really have that luxury, but, um, so I put him in a six by four foot vision or six by three foot vision. So that's where he stays during the day. But when I'm home, when I'm, excuse me, when I get home, um, I let Zoe out and he walks around and kind of makes his round and then he will crawl up onto my bed and just sit there. Um, and he just loves being the center of attention and he loves being included into just your life. It's, it's amazing. Yeah. That's so cool. I mean, there's, 
iguana when I've, I've talked to a few people that own iguanas and they all have very yeah. similar stories I, mean, I think probably because they're so social uh, in the wild but they seem to really almost act like dogs and they do. You know, some people will say like you know reptiles they, they don't learn they don't like being around people and, and you know they tolerate being around people but they don't actually like being around people iguanas really you know have a case for sort of against that argument it really seems right. like they enjoy it right and i'm and i will say the same thing for um for you know some monitor species and tegus and I'll, I'll even make that case for turtles and tortoises um i know a lot of people say that the tortoises are more food driven than not and they're more of a routine animal but i i don't I mean, I could definitely argue against that. Uh, in the summertime, we try to, um, you know, keep our, our sulcatas free roaming and our redfoots free roaming um, for the most part. And those animals will, like, I, I love gardening. So I'll be over, you know, bent over gardening in, in one of our plots and I'll have the sulcatas just plop themselves right. They'll come from across the yard, plop themselves right next to me and just be content sitting. There. Um, not that they're eating anything. They just want to be next to you. Yeah. Um, and it's it's definitely opened up my mind, uh, you know, ten times that what it was prior to, to owning individuals like this because they're they're so sociable and they want to be interacted with. Well, and there's lots of academic research using all those species that you just mentioned in terms of, of people, you know, in an academic setting, getting them to learn. Uh, like the tortoises, turtles, and monitor lizards for sure are some of the main animals that they use a lot of the times to prove that. So there's definitely something there. Yeah, for sure. I definitely agree. And I know that you guys also have a caiman lizard. I don't know if that's at your place or, or if it's at Mike's place, but yeah. those are so cool. Yeah, yeah, that's Drax. So that's Mike's baby. Um, and uh, we received that animal or we purchased that animal uh, two years ago. Um, and getting him to eat was was, was quite a challenge. Um, he, you know, knowing caiman lizards, their jaws are designed to crush uh, snail shells. And so, um, one, finding snail meat was... Uh, in, in surplus, I should say, was difficult because you can always get the, what is it, the zoo mail, zoo med, uh, can of snail or whatever it is. Yeah. But, um, you know, again, this animal is going to grow up to potentially four and a half, five feet long as an adult. So we wanted to ensure that we could, you know, get these animal or get uh, enough snail meat um, to basically shape, satiate this animal's needs. Um, so we, you know, found, you know, Greek markets, uh, Chinese markets and, and started finding things like that. Um, you know, and able to, uh, to, to get the uh, you know, appropriate amount of snail meat that we could. And now we've gotten him to eat, you know, different things. So now that he's gotten more used to us and, and comfortable with us, um, he's definitely, you know, expanded his, his diet a little bit more. And it's, I mean, it's showing he's growing, you know, by the day. So um, what are, what are some other things for us to tap in? What are some other things uh, that they can eat? Um, honestly, they can eat anything really a tegu can. Um, all the, I guess we haven't really offered it any type of, um, uh, uh, vegetation. So I guess it takes uh, diet's a little bit more diverse in that sense, but, um, you know, we'll feed it anything from, from smelt or silver side fish. Um, we'll try, you know, rodents, we'll try, uh, Dale chicks, like quail chicks or dozen chicks. Um, and we, we've, uh, tried a uh, Missouri croc diet, which we've actually found if we mix the Missouri crocodile diet with. Um, snail meat and uh, crushed up superworms that actually have done very well as well. Um, and Mike's really good at like you know at m making those slurries and putting them in the ice cube trays and, and doing stuff like that. So um, that has been his like little project the last couple of years, and it's it's definitely paid off because this animal is happy, healthy, and and is oh my, it's just a beautiful uh, uh, ambassador species. For well, they they are a beautiful looking animal, and the first time when I'd seen them online, obviously you, see, you come across them, and of course it's so hard to judge the size of them when you see a picture. But I had right. seen one in Twin City Reptiles, which is a reptile store in Minnesota, and. Yeah. I was, it was a full grown one. I was completely astonished at how big, I had no idea that they get that big. Yeah. They're huge. Yeah. Yeah. Um, my first interaction with them was actually at the Shedd Aquarium here in Chicago and, um, you know, big props to them because they were, I believe the first institution in the AZA to successfully breed them in captivity. Um, and they had this beautiful display with these animals and I was hooked from, from, from that day. And I think it was in the early, early two thousands is when they, they accomplished that. But, um, ever since then, you really didn't see him much on the market. Um, and once we did, um, you know, we definitely paid, you know, uh, you know, pretty penny for it, but it was well worth it, you know, for, for a healthy and established, uh, you know, young baby. And, um, you know, I, I hopefully, you know, this kind of encourages more people to, to work with them and to, you know, to, to get into them. And he handles very well, like you said. 
He does. Yeah. So, um, he's a little cage aggressive when you get him out, but again, that's, you know, kind of most lizards, they're a little territorial of their, of their cages, but once you get him out, he's a puppy dog. I mean, we, I, I feel comfortable giving him to, um, you know, to a child. I mean, he's, he's awesome. That's cool. And I know you have a, a an alligator as well. You guys, you guys have, uh, yeah. I'm, sure, I'm sure that's part of Mike's collection. That sounds like one of the, he, maybe he has the bigger animals. Uh, no, uh, actually, no. So it's kind of the opposite. Mike oh. has all of the uh, Mike has all of the invertebrates and uh, and a lot of turtles, uh, invertebrates, amphibians, and then he's really big into turtles. Um, Drax is just one of I guess one of the few lizards he does keep. Uh, he keeps uh, Leechianus. Uh, he keeps and breeds Leechianus. He has Drax. He's got his albino um, albino iguana uh, uh, reptar, and um, I think that's all the lizards. That he so the rest of them are is, is a huge collection of amphibians um, and invertebrates. I mean, it's it's absolutely intense. But um, the Chubbs, the alligator, Chubbs is at my house. Chubbs is actually in my bedroom, um, right next to Zoe. Um, and yeah, up until uh, last year in April or last year May or last year March, um, it was illegal to own alligators here in the state of Illinois. And so uh, they finally made a permit system. So people that were owning them owning alligators prior were doing so illegally and, you know, risk, you know, getting fines and, and having their animals taken away. So, um, you know, not owning an alligator prior to that, I was, you know, trying to do it the correct way because obviously you don't want to be messing with the government there. It's never a good idea, but yeah. Um, so yeah, we got Chubbs, uh, back in, we got our permit in April and we got Chubbs in June, Chubbs, yeah, Chubbs in June. And, uh, we had ordered them from, I think it was just a, a company out of like Tampa and we had them shipped up to a local uh, airport here in O'Hare and we went to go pick them up and the guy in front of us was actually picking up, like, a, he said, he's like, oh, I'm here to pick up a loved one. And I go, why wouldn't you just go to the terminal? Why is he going to the, to the, to the cargo? I'm like, oh no. And it was, he was picking up a, a deceased uh, family member. And so as I was picking up chugs in his crate, he was this guy next park next to us was shoving a body into his oh my God. next to us. So I was like covering Chubb's eyes. I was like, Chubb's don't look. Yeah. Don't, um, don't look at that. But yeah, no Chubb's came in. Yeah. So uh, Chubb's came in as like a little, um, you know, two and a half foot, you know, three foot gator. And um, you know, he was definitely, you know, well-rounded back then, but he's grown, he's grown just a little bit uh, since we've gotten him. Um, you know, I'm not trying to force feed him and get him super huge. You know, I definitely want him to grow um, at his own pace, but, um, you know, having an alligator has been a, a really cool experience. Um, just getting them on target training and, and things like that has been a very rewarding process as well. I haven't really done that with any of my other uh, animals, but I figured since I'm working with a, a you know a large predator, um, and you know, one day he will be you know, uh, you know, several feet, that it would be a good idea to start that target training early. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Can Can you just uh, explain to anybody that doesn't know what target training is, kind of what the process you you use? Yeah. So, um, target training is just you you know you have a like a, either a tennis ball or what I've used is just a little Kong and a doll rod. And uh, what you do is that animal is um, is supposed to touch its nose or its mouth to the tip of that that um, at the target. And once it does so, then you reward it with a uh, a food item. And so, um, doing that helps them, um, stay on point when it comes to, you know, just direction where you want them to go. Um, and that could even help us out later on when it comes to working on sets and things like that, when it comes to, uh, to, you know, Chubb's potential, um, later on. Yeah, that's, and has he been responding fairly well to it? Oh yeah. Exactly. I mean, sometimes he thinks that the Kong is, is made for, for chewing, but most of the time he'll, but it also depends on how hungry he is too. Um. But uh, yeah, no, it, it's definitely, it's de been working out great. Yeah, that's very cool. And obviously, yeah, like you said, this is going to be a big predator species. You definitely want to make sure he's someone that can be handled and moved. And I am sure you're going to have to move him out of your room at some point. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, that's, it's just for now, I figured, you know, the first year or two that I've got him, um, it's something that I want close to me. Uh, I feel like the, the animals that are in my room um, definitely get extra attention because they do see more of the downtime. Um, it's less maintaining, um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's less maintaining and more social interaction. Um, so like there's no snakes in my room cause I don't, you know, I don't, uh, socialize those animals, uh, the way that I do with like a lizard or, or a turtle. Right. That makes sense. And you have an anaconda as well. Yeah. I've got two, uh, Nebula and Gamora. So if you're fans of Guardians of the Galaxy, that's where those names came from. Are they both females? 
Yeah, they're both females. Oh, that's cool. So that's going to yeah. be another uh, very large snake at some point. Yeah. Um, yeah, they're amazing snakes. I never, uh, I actually never anticipated owning an anaconda. Um, when I had worked with them previously, uh, with a previous employer, I did not get the best impression from those. Um, and, you know, just basically looked at them as fire hoses with, with teeth. Um, they were, they were kind of rude. They, they, I would say just the most defensive danger noodles you've ever met in your entire <laughs> life. Um, they are, they, you know, the fact that those animals could strike at you backwards blew my mind and just kept me away from them forever. Oh, yeah. Um, but yeah, I had a friend that, you know, was, was looking to rehome one and, you know, I stopped by and this was like on, you know, uh, it was like December 23rd of, uh, 2014 and I'm like, oh, you know, uh, maybe I'll go take a look at them. And I, I picked up, uh, what, what is now Gamora, um, who was just, just under three feet at the time. And, uh, I was like, you know what? She's really good. I mean, again, she could just be calm because she wasn't heated up or anything, but she proved that she was, you know, great from the get go. Um, and, you know, I definitely attribute that to captive breeding because she was a, a captive bred uh, species or specimen. So, um, no, but she was uh, amazing. Uh, and then uh, now, I mean, from being two and a half, three feet at that time, now she's up to close to eight, eight and a half feet. Um, they're very slow growing animals. They definitely grow a lot of mass before they actually grow in length. Um, but she is, oh my God, she's an absolutely amazing uh, ambassador. And uh, Nebula was another animal or a uh, individual that we got last May, um, she was at the Wildlife Discovery Center, but the Wildlife Discovery Center in Lake Forest, um, who's uh, run by uh, Rob Carmichael, a curator up there, um, they saved her from being euthanized in Colorado. Apparently, they had found this animal just randomly somewhere. I don't know the, the whole entire story, but um, they had her shipped up to the center because they obviously didn't want to see this beautiful animal uh, euthanized. So, um and from the get-go, she had just an amazing disposition. And we got her around 10 feet, um, and she's, she's absolutely amazing. Well, they're such an impressive species, and they're almost that one species that, well, everybody knows anaconda, even if you've never, if you're not right, in the hobby right. at all. And they're fairly recognizable, too. I assume most people who see, or maybe not, I don't know, do most people know it's an anaconda right away when, when they see it? You'd, you'd be surprised on how many times I'd bring out our big uh, Burmese python and people say anaconda. Oh, okay, um, yeah. You know, I, I think that people just know the term anaconda. Um, they don't actually know what it actually looks like. Um, but I think people just think of, uh, they just attribute to a big snake being an anaconda. Um, right. I don't know if they necessarily identify it with, but most people do. They'll, they'll say anaconda. Um, but yeah, no, I, it seems to be uh, kind of a big showstopper because up until, I think we were the one of the first in Chicago and area to even bring one around to, to educational programs. Um, and uh, when people saw that we were doing that, they it was kind of like mind blowing because there weren't any uh, there weren't, weren't any um, like species that were super or uh, I guess specific individuals that were super tolerant of of being handled or you know being worked with on a on a you know hand uh, hand basis. So. Yeah, that's cool. And they're so iconic. And you know that everybody that leaves that show goes and tells their friends, I touched an anaconda. I saw right, an anaconda. Right. Do you do anything in, in terms of how they eat? Because in the wild, these animals eat probably like, you know, twice or three times a year, but eating a giant meal, obviously you're not feeding them deer. Do you just kind of feed no. them like, like a normal, like you'd feed your, your retics? Yeah. Um, with, with my, so, and I'm not even sure exactly who to pinpoint on, on this advice, but you, you tend to hear it with a lot of those uh, keepers of the more unique species or more, uh, you know, rare species, but, um, you know, keeping animals on a, on a, uh, a sparse feeding schedule is better than, than not, and more so with the snakes. Mm -hmm. Um, I, um, I try to feed them a large meal and space it out by, you know, you know, like uh, two to three weeks. I don't like to, um, I don't like to be feeding every week or every other week. Um, three weeks is like the closest I will feed um, a big, a big uh, constrictor. Um, but right now, Gamora only feeds on poultry. And so um, she'll get a couple of drumsticks or now because she's so big, she'll get like turkey, uh, turkey legs or turkey drumsticks. Um, you know, again, once, once a month. Um, yeah. And, and two, that is also, um, helps out with our rotation in the sense where if you are feeding such a large meal like that, um, 
you have to anticipate within a week or two that animal's going to go into shed because they are getting a, a decent meal like that. So um, that's something where, you know, if we are feeding one snake a large meal, the other one is going to get more of a smaller meal just as a maintenance meal um, so that that animal is not going to be forced into shed within two weeks. So you can almost time out when one's going to go into shed, you know, and when, you know, one isn't. So but right, sometimes uh, you mess up and, you know, it's not as, as calculated as possible, but. Do you ever, would you just refuse to take an animal while it's in shed? Um, yes and no. It definitely depends on the individual. Um, right. Missy, um, our, our biggest girl, we, I brought her to shows when she's in shed. Um, and generally, um, with the big snakes, people like to do the photo finish where the kids line up and take the photo and whatnot. Um, and I've kind of started steering away from that one because, you know, again, my, our animals are super tolerant and, you know, it, it doesn't really bother them as much, but in Illinois, they're really enforcing this. Um, if you are holding a python or boa, the the owner of the snake needs to maintain control of its head. And so um, now that they're enforcing that a lot more with, you know, again, when you're going to a, a birthday party or an event, a lot of people are taking photos. So, um, you know, if you were to slip up once and not maintain or there's a questionable photo out there, um, it could look bad on you and you might be charged with, you know, you know, mishandling or endangerment or, you know, whatever the, the government sees fit on charging with because how crazy they are these days. But um, <laughs> we've kind of gotten away with that. So um, having the animal draped along like a table or what we'll do is we'll line up all of our show tubs and we'll line her up that way. I feel more comfortable um, handling her that way when she's under shed than I would if I had the kids, you know, uh, draped out, um, you know, uh, shoulder to shoulder holding this animal. So, um, yeah, yeah. but again, it does... Yeah, it does. It does depend on the on the individual. We've got an albino berm who's around twelve feet, um, and she's a little bit more cranky when she can't see, and so that's an animal that I definitely would not be be uh, would be taking out when it comes to uh, to being a chip. Yeah, that makes sense. You want to reduce all the variables as possible. So, I know that you've so obviously we've kind of touched on some of that production work that you've done. Uh, can you tell? I, a little bit about some of the, the TV sets you've worked on, the movie sets, and it's sort of a really interesting aspect to, to some of the business that you do. Yeah. Um, so uh, we've been on everything from, and I had to write it down because, I mean, it's not like we've done a ton, but um, you, you forget. tend to forget sometimes. Yeah. But um, we did, we've done some promotional stuff for the show Empire, which I mean, that's all I'll say about that since it's in kind of like the, the limelight right now with some of the scandals that are going on there. But <laughs> yeah. um, Chicago Chicago Fire, uh, we've had a tortoise on, um, which was really cool. Uh, Mortis, our, our African bird type tortoise. Uh, we've had animals on The Exorcist, the TV series with Gina Davis, which is uh, you know one of the leads from Beetlejuice, uh, League of Their Own. Um, and uh, that was really cool. Uh, there is a Netflix series called Sense Eight that we had some some bugs on for an episode. I wasn't really uh, into that series, so I honestly couldn't even tell you what episode in season two that those animals are on. But um, Chicago Med is another show filmed here in Chicago, and we've had multiple you know bugs and things on that show. Um, we did a California almonds commercial once that was random. Um, <laughs> we did a couple pilots, which. Um, we did a couple of pilots and that's actually one of the reasons why we obtained, uh, Zoe is because they were looking for an iguana and at the time we just didn't have one. And so, um, we acquired, uh, Zoe for that, uh, for that, uh, series. Um, and you know, Zoe ended up just being this you know, amazing animal, um, altogether. Uh, and that was called Zubiquity, um, which had a really cool concept of like a, it was like a heart surgeon and like a vet were teaming up to solve, you know, medical mysteries and things using animals and whatever. But, um, uh, another pilot called Southside, uh, which we use, use some rodents for. Um, and, uh, the, uh, we, we have a, a, a resource to find rodents because obviously in the reptile industry, you need feeders. Um, and when you go to your local pet stores, finding brown rats are kind of, uh, hard to do. So, um, we've kept a group of, of brown rats that we use, um, specifically for production because we socialize them, um, and, you know, get them used to, you know, being on set and just to, you know, be I guess, used to human interaction in general. Um, but yeah, uh, Chicago Justice, The Carbon Arrow Effect, which is like a magical prank show on True TV. And then uh, finally, our last one that we just released last week was a movie called Captive State um, that we had, you know, several animals on from praying mantises to fruit flies and, uh, and rats. But they cut the fruit flies and the praying mantis out 
Um, so hopefully they'll have those in like the deleted scenes somewhere. But I was kind of disappointed when, you know, my, my family and I showed up to the theater and they only showed the rats. And I was like, oh, darn, that kind of sucks. But I know <laughs> I was there and, you know, I that the experience definitely outweighs the, uh, the actual uh, final product. So tell me about that experience. What is that like? Like, what what do you do? You just bring your animals and then they kind of tell you where they want them or? Yeah. So with, you know, not to say that our, our animals are, are, um, are more simple than, than like a dog or a cat, but really when it comes to the animals that, you know, we, we work with, it's just kind of a, put them there, let them do what they're going to do. And they'll shoot the camera. There's really not too much uh, nothing too technical with, with having those animals on set, which has actually been very nice for us. Um, but yeah, like, um, for instance, we'll do, um, you know, Zubiquity with, uh, with Zoe. All they wanted to do was have Zoe sitting on, um, you know, someone's shoulder in a waiting room. That was it. Um, you know, for the, the show Southside with the rats, there was a part in the show where they wanted, um, you know, the rats to be crawling around uh, a basement kitchen um, eating up some Swedish meatballs. So they, you know, they put some sauce on the ground and whatever. And, you know, it was basically just let the animals do what the animals are going to do. And it just, the, the final product always turns out just hilarious and, and, and amazing. But yeah. Yeah, that's really cool. I'm sure that's a lot of fun. And, and uh, the animals are used to being socialized anyway. So that's just sort of an added thing. And y- right. you don't really think about where they get these animals. I mean, you see animals yeah. on TV all the time and movies, and I guess they are somebody's animals. They're not the movie producers. They got to call somebody in. Right. Yeah. Um, one of my I, one of my big, uh, you know, big role models in the industry is Jules Sylvester. Um, who is you know, a, a well, well-known well animal handler, uh, specifically with reptiles in the Hollywood scene. He's, you know, uh, he's yeah, been an animal handler on productions like, you know, such as like the Jurassic World or Jurassic Park series, uh, Lemony Snicket series, of Unfortunate Events, um, Snakes on a Plane. Uh, there's just been so many different, uh, you know, motion pictures and iconic um, for our industry that, you know, he's been a part of. So. That's very cool. Awesome. Well, do you have... Um in terms of future plans for, for Crosstown Exotics, do you have anything in the works or are you just going to kind of continue on what you're doing and just grow the, cause you have a lot going on, obviously. Yeah. Um, you know, it's just continued to grow right now. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, eventually it's, it's for me getting a house. Um, you know, right now I'm living with my parents and, uh, you know, keeping these animals on top of, you know, uh, you know, having, uh, more individuals in this house than, um, than average it's you know now it's the next step is finding a house and getting a uh uh, i wouldn't say more appropriate because i feel like they're it's they're adequately housed now but um you know a little bit more space for these animals and and you know maybe upgrade you know a couple of enclosures and stuff like that so it's definitely moving on to to a bigger and uh, a better house yeah you know your collection's big when you need a new house Right. Or, I mean, when you're, when you're 28 years old and you're still living at home, but hey, I feel like that's like, a, that's a common thing nowadays. So yeah, it not. is for our generation. It's not unusual at all. Right. Right. Well, I, uh, I really appreciate you coming on. And like I said, I think you guys are at the sort of the forefront and I'm so glad that there's role models like you in the community who are, who are introducing kids and people to these animals for the first time in a really positive way. So, so that's, uh, that's awesome. And can you let everybody know where they can find you online? Yeah. Um, so yeah, if you uh, find us on Facebook or Instagram uh, at Crosstown Exotics, and specifically for Instagram, it's Crosstown underscore Exotics. But I'm sure if you were to type in Crosstown Exotics, you can find us. Um, and then yeah, on YouTube, Crosstown Exotics, we're starting to uh, document our our travels, uh, you know, uh, with YouTube. So awesome. Well, I really appreciate you coming on. Thank you very much. Yeah, no problem. Thanks, Dylan. I appreciate it. Okay, that is the end of another episode. Thank you so much for listening to the show. Colin, if you're listening to this, thank you so much for being a guest. I really, really enjoyed that conversation. I had a lot of fun chatting with Colin. He's definitely, you know, using the the sort of the classic reptile presenter model, but then he has some other aspects such as the the critter classes and, you, you know, the TV production, some other areas that we don't often get exposed to. So that was a great conversation. What do you think of the the critter care classes? I I love that idea. I think, you know, it's so classic to have your after school sports and your after school piano, but I've never really heard or thought of the concept of having like an after school like sort of science type class and and maybe that is common in other areas definitely not common where i'm from so i thought that was a fantastic idea so so thanks again colin for 
coming on and chatting with us about that. As a listener, thank you so much for listening. Please, if you want to rate this podcast, go to the Apple Podcasting app, give it a five-star rating if you're enjoying it. I know I'd love to read a review from you if you if you happen to leave one. If you are interested in sporting the Animals at Home brand, you can go to animalsathome.ca slash shop and there are sweaters and t-shirts there. We do have new colors in the sweaters and you can find those on Instagram if you're curious uh, what the colors are. They're navy and burgundy. And as you know, $5 does get donated to the Amazon Rainforest Conservancy with the purchase of every sweater. And I think that is it for today. So thank you so much for listening again and we'll talk to you guys next time.